and um, I think that's that's the only announcements. All right. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started this evening, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer. We need to make sure that we are in right relationship with the Lord, walking by the Spirit. Uh, before our time in the Word or anything in the spiritual life has any eternal value. So we'll bow our heads together, and after a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so very grateful for all the many ways in which you have provided for this congregation, for the impact that uh, your word has in their lives and as they grow spiritually, and as that is a testimony to those around them and also to the world. We're thankful for those who are part of this congregation via the media ministry through live streaming and, and watching on the internet, and we're thankful for them and uh, their growth and the impact that your word has upon them. Father, we're thankful for the many missionaries that go out, those who are official missionaries, such as uh, Jim Myers, George Meisner, Chafer Seminary, uh, the Small Yards. Father, we pray for them, uh, that you would watch over their health and provide for their uh, their very various needs and expand their, uh, their ministries. And Father, I know from uh, just watching the congregation the last week or so that many people are beginning to come down with winter colds and flu and many other things. And we pray that you would uh, keep them strong and healthy as they fight off these various uh, viruses and that they would return to us uh, strong and healthy. And Father, we pray for us tonight as we uh, focus on your word that you might give us great understanding of the truth of your word and think in terms of how God the Holy Spirit has preserved this so that we might learn what you have done in history that validates, vindicates your character, and also uh, provides for us a framework on how we can apply your word uh, to situations we all face every day. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. I want you to be, want to begin, I want you to open your Bibles to two passages. You can stick your finger or thumb or something into uh, one of them, and, and then we'll go to the other one. One of them is, is Psalm 34, and we may hit that first. So you could start there if you just want to look at one place. And then the other is in our passage in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 21, 1 Samuel chapter 21. Now, the, the <clears throat> uh, backdrop for Psalm 34 is 1 Samuel chapter 21. But we're not going to look at Psalm 34 tonight other than uh, to get a framework uh, so that we can uh, read it through, understand it, get an idea of what is in Psalm 34. And then when we look at uh, 1 Samuel 21... We can think about those details that are going on in David's life and understand how those specific situations were dealt with by, by David in light, of, um, uh, in light of what we learn in Psalm, Psalm 34. Uh, there's a, when we look at this section that's coming up that we've actually entered into already with 1 Samuel chapter 20, where David is uh, working with Jonathan to figure out just exactly what Saul's mindset is. Is Saul going to uh, try to kill him or just what's happening? And, and uh, then his realization that Saul does have, uh, have a great desire to kill him and even tries to kill Jonathan. And so uh, David, David escapes and he flees, and that's where we pick up the story in, in 1 Samuel chapter 21. But this continues first through 1 Samuel 21, 1 Samuel 22, 23, uh, 24. And as we go through this, 
I, I'm sure that you will see a lot of areas where you can go home and apply the tax because uh, if you ever find yourself uh, running through the desert trying to escape somebody that's trying to take your life, uh, this is the passage to go to. But there's a lot here that we can extrapolate and we have to remember that passages such as 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that I quoted last time talk about the fact that these things were written for our edification, that we are reminded of them and that we are to look at these all these different events in the Old Testament and think in terms of of how they exhibit the application of doctrine in the lives of the main people or the lack of application of doctrine as as the case may be. So we need to take, think about two things when we go to a lot of these episodes in the Old Testament. Uh, first of all, I think just as a caveat, as a warning before we look at those two things, is don't become guilty of just sort of... Uh, isolating these events and pulling them out of context and then uh, then it sort of free floats and you find this a lot this is such a terrible methodology we have in so many uh, so many uh, theological studies and biblical studies and and the result is that people just think of all these different events as isolated incidents rather than understanding how they fit with the flow and, under, and, and structure of Scripture and the outworking of God's plan, ultimately leading, especially when we think of the Old Testament, ultimately leading to the arrival of, of Jesus, uh, the Messiah. So that's a caveat. Don't just isolate these incidents, but understand uh, the, the context. So the first question that we have to ask whenever we look at these is just what is going on here? What's the historical uh, situation? Because we believe that all of these events happened to real people who lived in real places and that we need to understand what the original circumstance and situation was. And Along with that, we need to understand why, why was it that God the Holy Spirit decided to record and reveal to us these situations and circumstances the way he did and not others? Because there's probably about 10,000 or more specific circumstances and situations in David's life, and we only have maybe less than 100 of them. Why those and why not others? The holy, there's a reason and a purpose there, and that these are designed to teach us something, as we're going to see, because what comes out of these, this situation at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 21 is going to be Psalm 34. And Psalm 34 has, in the second half of it, from verse 11 to 22, a very strong uh section designed to teach or instruct uh, members of the congregation of Israel to instruct believers on how they should live. And so it, 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 when you put these two together, you come out with the full uh, full story of what's going on. So we start off, we have to really understand what happened in the historical situation, and that means reading through and understanding what's happening in 1 Samuel 21. If you just take 1 Samuel 21 in isolation, you may be left going, well, how am I really going to apply this in my life? What's, what's, the, what's the purpose here? We sort of ran into that a little bit the last time when we were in uh, 1 Samuel 20. Now, uh, here's the passage I quoted uh, last time, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, that all these things happened to them as examples and were written for our admonition. So that's talking about everything in the Old Testament. So we look at the historical situation, and then we see how it parallels our own situation. That's the example. It is to give us a, an example and a, uh, a, an illustration of the application of doctrine in a tight situation, in a difficult—and and David is certainly in an extremely tight situation as he has the king— of Israel seeking his life and sending out all of his troops to try to find him and to try to uh, to try to destroy him. So we look at the historical situation and then we look need to look at some parallels between that historical situation and circumstances and situations we may run into 
on an everyday basis. That's ap the area we refer to as application. And I say this again and again and again, that there's three areas uh, that we focus on in doing Bible study. First thing we do is ask the question, what does the text say? That's known as observation. Observation, observation. Dr. Hendricks used to say that most people spend 2% of their time in observation and about 1% of their time in interpretation, and they immediately jump to the question, uh, what about me? How what does this mean to me? And if you go to some churches and some Sunday school classes or small groups, which are so popular today, the question that is often asked is, well, what does that mean to you? We're just so self-absorbed. None of that has anything to do with real Bible study. That's just a, that's just a, an exercise in self-absorption and uh, generating your own ideas about Scripture rather than really studying, uh, studying the Scripture. So we have to spend more time, as uh, Dr. Hendricks used to say, when you do Bible study, if you spend 70% of your time or 80% of your time doing observation, then you're really going to know what the text is saying. And then the more you clearly understand what the text is saying, then the interpretation, which answers the question, what does this mean, becomes really apparent. It's not that difficult to answer that question if you really understand the, what, it, what it's saying. And the more you understand what it's saying, the easier it is to answer that question, what does it mean? And then usually if you've spent that much time, 90%, 95% of your time answering those two questions, then it's really obvious that what God wants you to do about it. And so application becomes rather, rather simple. And so um, th this, is, this, is, this is important. Now, when we look at the life of David here in this, this period between uh, his uh, anointing in 1 Samuel 16 and the time he becomes king, which is in 2 Samuel chapter 1, David is in a, a really interesting circumstance where most of the time he is viewed as the enemy of Saul, King Saul, and King Saul is trying, uh, trying to uh, kill him. And so he writes these psalms, these historically connected psalms, a lot of them during this period, there's 12 that he wrote that have specific historical connections stated at the beginning. And, um, and so he's writing, writing them. Now, as we look at Samuel, as we study Samuel, written probably a good bit of it was written by Samuel, others by those he trained in the school of the prophets. Uh, we see that Samuel, first and second Samuel, must be understood to be one book, one theme, one focus. That Sa the focus is on uh, how God is bringing redemption or renewal to Israel. They are indistinguishable from the Canaanites at the beginning of the of First Samuel. They are in carnality, rebellion against God. They're self-absorbed, and yet God is going to change that by bringing about a total reversal of their circumstances through his anointed one. And that is the term Mashiach. So that is through David. David is the one who's going to bring them from deliverance from the Philistines. At the beginning of 1 Samuel, the Philistines virtually have them enslaved. They're in so much dominion. Uh, they're have, exercising so much dominion over Israel. But by the time we get to the end of 2 Samuel and the death of David, uh, Israel has established a magnificent kingdom, or David has established a magnificent kingdom, and is the dominant kingdom in the world at that time, according to these, uh, these books of Samuel that we read. The focus spiritually is on how God raises up David, and through David is going to turn the nation around. David is viewed also as the progenitor or the type or shadow person of the Messiah, uh, who will, and he is the great king of Judah. This, he's the greatest king uh, of Israel, and that he was blessed of God. And so as we read through Samuel, we see how, Samuel, how the author uh, connects these events uh, going back to the seed of the woman, the promise in Genesis 3.15 that God is going to 
uh, bring redemption through the seed of the woman, and you trace that seed all the way through the previous books, and then when you come to Samuel, that that seed it continues. We saw it in, in, in Genesis that the seed is going to come through the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then by Genesis chapter 49, the seed is going to come through one of Jacob's sons, Judah. And then by the time we get through the period of the judges to the book of Ruth, we see that it's going to come through a descendant of, of Rahab, uh, the harlot, and also of Ruth, whose grandson is Jesse, and uh, David is his son. So we're tracing the line of the seed that uh, is like, like David. Now, that is David. And then when we get into 1 Samuel, and we get it from 1 Samuel 16 on, and we're talking about David, we don't see an idealized version of David. So often you read these uh, historians that see a hero, and they uh, tell the story of this hero. They tell about his life, and, and uh, he, nothing negative is said. We see negatives uh, in David's life, and we see many of his uh, faults and flaws and his sins, uh, but it's all described in the service of the main narrative, which is how God is working in the life of the nation through David uh, to bring about their, their deliverance. We see David cast in the role of the faith hero, but not in the same way that you would have a faith hero described in the pagan literature of the time. But David is has an antagonist, and that is Saul, and he's fleeing from Saul in the wilderness. He's trying to stay alive. He's pulling his uh, various plans together as to how he's going to stay alive and what he's going to do to stay out of the clutches of Saul. And we're told about his various skills at combat. We're told about his skills at survival, uh, how he handles himself when he finds himself uh, almost trapped in the Philistine uh, city of Gath. Uh, we learn of his ingenuity in the book of Samuel, and we learn of his wise actions, but we don't see what's behind those wise actions. In the Psalms that David wrote, we get a totally different perspective. In 1 Samuel 21, we, we learn about what happens but we don't learn what's going on between David's ears when he's in this crisis situation. But when we look at Psalm 24 or Psalm 34, we see the thinking that's going on in David's head. How did he reach these decisions? Why did he do the things that he is doing? And that's where we learn, learn great principles of genuine application in our thinking that we can emulate that by... Um, uh, taking in the Word of God, learning the Word of God, applying it in the category uh, of wisdom. So the Psalms that, that David writes during this time pull the curtain back on the spiritual struggles and successes that we see in David's life as he's facing hostility, as he's facing rejection, as he's facing uh, persecution, and someone who is trying to, uh, trying to take his life. Now, <coughs> Tonight, I want to uh, just read through, making a few comments, uh, Psalm 34. There's 22 verses in Psalm 34, and we will uh, read through this because we can't, even though Psalm 34 is in the Psalms and 1 Samuel 21 is in 1 Samuel, they go together. And to get the full picture of what's happening at this time, uh, we have to understand what is what is going on. So the background that we have seen is set up in 1 Samuel chapter 20. David's fleeing from Saul, uh, and he knows that Saul is seeking his life. Saul sent uh, hit teams to surround his house, and we studied the psalm that he wrote at that time. Uh, Jonathan has uh, protected him. His wife, Michal, who's the daughter of uh, Michal, who's the daughter of Saul, uh, has also protected him. And now he and Jonathan have reconfirmed their covenant with one another. Jonathan has expanded that, that David is always going to watch over and protect his children in case something happens, happens to him. And uh, he uh, confirms his, his uh, uh, 
uh, loyalty to David and that together they're going, they devise a plan to determine what Saul's frame of mind is and what his intentions are. In chapter 20, we learn it's confirmed that Saul wants to kill David. He also attempted to kill Jonathan at that time. And this is part of people testing. So I just want to review this a little bit. Some of the worst testing we face in life has to do with people because we have to live with, be friends with, be married to people who have sin natures, work with people who have sin natures, work under people who have sin natures, and work over people who have sin natures. And if we don't understand this issue of sin natures and how, how sin affects people's behavior, then, then we're constantly going to be disappointed by people and as well as hurt by people. So first of all, just to review, people testing takes place when we're faced with challenges in personal relationships. And they can happen in all kinds of relationships, friends, family, um, uh, employers, employees, students, teachers, colleagues, all kinds. And it comes in two forms, people who oppose us and people who do things that challenge our loyalty to them. Okay, people who do things to us, they oppose us, like Saul is opposing David, and also people who challenge our loyalty because Saul Saul's assaults on David challenge David's loyalty to Saul, his submission to his king and submission to authority. Second, I said that all people testing is is resolved through the use of these five spiritual skills, these five problem-solving devices. The first three are basic to anything in the spiritual life. We have to walk by the Spirit. If we're walking according to the flesh, it leads to enmity and divisions and to slander and to gossip and to murder. All of these are part of walking according to the flesh. So we are to walk by the Spirit, and that produces love. We are to love one another as Christ loved the church and love uh, lo- love our neighbors ourselves. That's grace orientation. You can't love if you don't understand grace. Grace means unmerited favor, undeserved kindness. So when we have people in our lives who offend us, people in our lives who hurt our feelings, people in our lives who reject us, people in our lives who do all kinds of things, some of it's intentional, some of it's not intentional, some of it is designed to, um, to hurt us, some of it is overt opposition motivated by jealousy and envy and bitterness and anger and hatred. We have to respond in grace and kindness. Uh, So that's grace orientation. We understand it because God looked at us and we were as obnoxious to God as we possibly could. Uh, Recently, I was reading a book that gave a great illustration of this. Uh, It was written by John Cross. Many of you know John Cross, who was founder of Good Seed Ministries. And he was talking about a time when he was uh, a missionary and they were first in Papua New Guinea. And they had built their their um, above-ground bungalow where where they lived, and a huge rat like a nutria had crawled up under the house and had died. And then uh, in that death, it had, uh, the body began to rot in that tropical humidity, and it just became totally uh, uh, infested with um, maggots and everything else. And you can imagine how bad it was. And the stench, and this was right under their bed, under the floor, under their bed, so that all of those noxious fumes came into the house. And he used that as an illustration of sin. That's how God looks at our sin. And the first thing they wanted to do is move out of the house and go somewhere else. Because when people are living on the basis of their sin nature, that's how it, that's how it appeals to God. But rather than, than leaving us on our own, God instead initiated a plan of salvation that was totally dependent on him and not on us. And we are more not obnoxious to God than a, a rotting corpse of a rat underneath the floorboards. So that's grace orientation, doctrinal orientation, as we start learning about the plan of God. And we understand what those implications are for our life as believers. As we learn and develop grace, we can then, because we understand and, and we grow in doctrine, we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're then able to love God. You cannot love someone you don't know. Now, a three-year-old or four-year-old can love mommy and daddy, 
But it's not real adult love. It's just affection. But when they become 25 or 30 or 35 after they've outgrown their adolescence a little bit and they can really appreciate their parents, then they can have real adult love. And that's the process in the spiritual life. We love God at each stage of our spiritual life, but only in relation to that age. So we have a baby type love, we have an adolescent type of love, and we have a mature love. So that becomes the foundation for our love for others. We love others because God loved us. As Christians, our motivation to love others has, should, ha, should have nothing to do with who they are or what they have done. Uh, Jesus manifested grace and love even towards the Roman soldiers and the thieves on the cross uh, when he was hanging on the cross. And so that is our example. Third point I mentioned was people testing falls under the category of all suffering. Therefore, it's either basically deserved or undeserved. So the first type is deserved suffering. That's the direct result of our own sinfulness or our own bad decisions, our foolishness. B, you have two categories of undeserved suffering, one that's the direct result of, of the sinfulness of those who are related to us or that we're surrounded by, and the other undeserved has nothing to do with those necessarily around us, but it's designed for uh, personal spiritual growth, such as when uh, God allowed the home, and the, the home and the lives of his sons and daughters to be destroyed, Uh, That wasn't the result of either carnal decisions of of associates or his own carnal decisions. So it's either deserved or undeserved, but it can all be transformed into blessing if we confess sin and we follow the Lord and apply, apply the word. And then last, I pointed out that when we're under attack, when we're under rejection or perceived rejection, or overt hostility, then we follow certain steps. First of all, we turn it over to the Lord, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. That calls for mental discipline and mental focus. That comes from confessing of sin, walking by the Spirit, taking in the Word, and structuring our thinking and the focus of our mind in a way that my my problems aren't my problems, they're God's problems, and I'm turning them over to Him. It's simple to say, many of us have gone through Operation uh, Yo-Yo, uh, where we just throw it to God and bring it back and throw it to God and bring it back. Uh, maybe that's uh, more like uh, what they call those things where you had the paddle ball and you had the, uh, the little rubber ball that was attached by a piece of uh, elastic, and you would sit there and you'd just, just pat, pat it back and forth. And so it just goes out, and then the elastic brings it back. That's how we treat uh, turning things over to the Lord. But eventually we can grow out of that. We have to think in terms of divine justice, as seen in Psalm 59. That was the uh, first psalm that we saw David write back in 1 Samuel chapter uh, chapter 19, I believe. And then we have to go the extra mile in being kind and thoughtful and gracious to the one who's the source of the test. And that means that we don't change the way we behave. Uh, We continue to reach out and be nice and kind to them. And fourth, we don't dwell on personal affronts, injuries, insults, or assaults. Now, that's what we're learning from from David. Now, when we look at, um, at Psalm 34, when we look at Psalm 34, it's basically divided into... Um, Uh, two sections. But before I get there, let me put this up here. There are two parts to 1 Samuel 21 also. First part is that David flees to Nob, which is the home of the priests, and he's seeking food and supplies from the high priest who is Ahimelech. And that's covered in the first nine verses. And then after he gets supplied with food and uh, armor, which is going to be the sword of Goliath, he's going to flee You think that they would go to 20 other places first, but he goes to Goliath's hometown, and he's going to flee to Gath and try to hide out among his enemies, the Philistines. And so we'll, we'll look at that, but that's the background. And it's that second part, when David flees to Gath and he tries to hide among the Philistines, that's the background for uh, Psalm 34, okay? 
And so in Psalm 34, we have two sections actually in the psalm. Uh, the first section is a, um, is a hymn of praise. It's a praise psalm. Uh, and then the second part is uh, descriptive praise. So there's these two parts of praise. You have declarative praise in verses 1 through 10. And then in verses 11 to 22, you have descriptive praise. Now, what's interesting is as part of the descriptive praise section from 11 to 22, which we'll cover uh, starting next week, you'll see that the psalm also has elements of instruction, that David is praising God and describing what God did to deliver him in this circumstance so that he can use that to teach others how they should live in the midst of these kinds of crises. So the descriptive praise has elements of instruction, elements of praise to God, elements of wisdom, uh, because this is what comes with spiritual maturity and the practice of doctrine is you develop an ability to make wise decisions. That's what uh, Proverbs is, is all about, and we've studied through uh, many things in Proverbs. And then it's also in the second half of the psalm, it gives thanksgiving to God. And as you read through it, I want you to pick out those elements uh, in, in the psalm. One of the other things that, that we should note as we look at the psalm, is that uh, there it picks out certain certain sins. Okay, so Psalm 34, as we look at the psalm, it's a psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech. Now, there's two names in here that are going to sound uh, similar: Ahimelech with an H, uh, that is the high priest, and Abimelech, who is uh, the the ki- king or ruler over over the city uh, the city of Gath. Now, in Psalm, as I said, as we go through the Psalm, I want you to notice a couple of things. We see a problem that is being addressed in the praise, and that is the problem of fear. In Psalm thirty four four, we read, "I sought the Lord, and He heard me, and delivered me from what? From Saul? No." from all my fears. So we have this whole complex of mental attitude sins that are associated with fear. It may may not be, each of these are a little bit different. We think about fear, we think about worry, and we worry and try to control all the things around us. Anxiety is another form of worry, maybe a little more intense. Dread is even more intense. Uh, a lot of people just struggle with a sense of a lack of confidence or insecurity. Our confidence shouldn't be in ourselves. Our confidence should be in the Lord. But some people just have a sense of insecurity or uncertainty. And then some people just live as if they're constantly on the panic button. So Psalm 34, 4 tells us that David is applying doctrine and he seeks the Lord and the Lord is the one who delivers him from all his fears. It's not some kind of technology. It's not learning some kind of new uh, skill in the battle or some kind of new strategy. Uh, It is the Lord turning it over to the Lord. He delivers us from all of our fears. And then in verse 7 we read, the angel of the Lord encamps around those um, who fear him. Now, that's a slightly different kind of fear that's mentioned there. In contrast to fearing people or circumstances or situation, in contrast to fearing rejection or hostility or persecution, the believer is to have courage from his fear of the Lord. That gives, him, gives us strength so that when we face difficult situations, confrontations with other individuals, facing difficult uh, situations that we have to deal with, with with people, sometimes family members, sometimes friends, or, or people we work with, we can have confidence because it's the Lord who encamps around us. That is, uh, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm 34, 9, we see fear, men- uh, fear of the Lord mentioned once again, where David says, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. 
the, for those who fear the Lord, God is going to supply their, their need. And then the didactic or the teaching section of the psalm comes in verse 11, uh, where it changes to that second part of, of uh, descriptive praise, or excuse me, declarative praise. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. That's the the pedagogical angle. This is designed to teach people how to fear the Lord so that they can develop the wisdom. The fear of the Lord, remember in Proverbs, is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't fear the Lord, which involves submission to his authority, then we don't develop that wisdom. So the first part of the psalm is declarative praise. The second part of the psalm is descriptive uh, praise, which includes instruction and challenge. I think I may have flipped those a minute ago, but declarative praise declares what God has done. And in descriptive praise, it's describing the consequences of what God has done, which is what brings in the teaching the teaching element. Let me just read it. What I, the reason I want to read this first is so that when we get over to 1 Samuel 21, and you're seeing what David went through historically, you, this helps you understand what's going on in his head. Because spiritual warfare, the spiritual life, takes place primarily between your ears and is related to your volition and your focus on the Lord. It's not related to external circumstances. So at verse 1 in the English, after we've already read the uh, superscript, which tells us the situation, David says, I will bless the Lord. That means to praise the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I've actually heard of a couple of different cases where some, somebody used that to ask his wife to marry him comes out it takes a little bit out of context but maybe it's an interesting application oh magnify the lord with me and let us exalt his name together that's not exactly what the context is saying but david is calling upon those who hear him to join him in magnifying the lord's name because of how he has uh, intervened in his personal life and then calling us to praise him to exalt his name together verse four i sought the lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Not some of them. Not a few of them. I, 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 all of them. He delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant. And their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him. And saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life? And loves many days that he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. As David is going through this, where he's being chased by Saul and he's trying to hide out among the Philistines and that doesn't work out for him real well. He recognizes that God is there with him. The eyes of the Lord, God's knowledge, God knows intimately what's going on in David's life. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. God will listen to your prayer. So when David gets in this bind, and we see what he does in 1 Samuel 21, he's not just coming up with a plan on his own. He goes to, he's going to the Lord in prayer and crying out to the Lord to deliver him. His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, that would be the Philistines, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears. He's talking about through this whole situation, he's praying and God is delivering him. And he says, God delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. That is somebody who is truly humble. 
to God, and save such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. I know a lot of people would say amen. David had his share of afflictions. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Not most of them, but all of them. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Okay, that's what will come out of this circumstance. So let's go back to 1 Samuel 21. We've got 15 verses here, and it's not that difficult to run through them and to understand the circumstance, but we need to get the historical circumstances first before we can understand the dynamics of what's going on inside David's David's head. So in verse 21... In verse 21, verse 1, we read, Now David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, Why are you alone, and no one is with you? Now, to get a little little background on this, we know, just in terms of thinking applicationally a little bit, Uh, For us, we know that we will face resentment. We'll face resentment from people. Some people are going to resent you because you don't fall apart in a crisis. Some people will resent you because uh, you seem to have a good marriage, a stable family life. Some people will resent you because you're just a Christian and they're hostile to Christianity. Some people will resent you because you seem to be stable. There are a lot of reasons that people will resent you, and then they'll reject you. That's the next stage. They'll resent you, then they'll reject you. They'll maybe, in some cases, that will harden into opposition or open hostility and maybe even escalate to the point of persecution. This may happen in in terms of governments and countries. Uh, There may be a time even in this country that people who overturn the First Amendment began to overtly attack Christians. And we've seen some in the courts where they're attacking Christians, and this is, I think, going to get even worse in our time. Um, There are those who are either not Christians or those who are carnal Christians who despise those who are Christians. Uh, Maybe it's just being ignored or ridiculed or gossiped about, but... uh, In many ways, we face some kind of opposition from people. Um, We will, in various degrees, be in a situation similar to that of David, where we are facing hostility from those whose agenda is the world's agenda, for those who are seeking their own and not the Lord's, for those who, for whatever reason, despise and hate Christians. In this period of David's life, we have to think about this a little bit. In this period of David's life, uh, this wilderness period that really began last time in chapter 20 and goes all the way up uh, through chapter uh, 26, uh, 27, uh, during this time, uh, it's an interesting time that is a foreshadowing of the relationship of Christ to the church. Let me explain what that means. This is, this is really important to understand this. David is anointed king, but he's not the king. This happens in 1 Samuel 16. He's anointed the king. And then he is rejected by Saul, who seeks to take his life and to destroy him. As a result of that, David has to flee out into the boonies. He's got to go into the desert, into the wilderness, into the uh, forest, uh, down in Moab for a while, and he is on the run, and he is a fugitive. But at the same time, because of Saul's horrible policies of government, there are people who are losing their money, losing their land, uh, they're losing their jobs, and they are becoming outcasts in their own home. And so they go find David, and they join themselves to David. They are, the, uh, they are those who are rejected by the elites that are in Saul's court and those who are uh, running, running the government. They join themselves to David, 
And there is a focus on the Lord in David's camp. There is spiritual teaching and a focus on the Lord. And the result is that these men that come together around David, we call David's mighty men, they become a cadre. They become a core around whom he builds his future administration so that when he comes into his kingdom, this is the power base. That is parallel to what happens with Christ in the church. Christ, Jesus, enters into human history. Jesus presents the kingdom. He presents himself as the king. This is analogous to David being anointed. But he is rejected, just as David was rejected. Uh, He becomes persecuted, and in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is uh, crucified and killed, uh, according to the plan of God from eternity past. But, and then he goes, he departs the earth. He goes to sit at the right hand of God, God the Father. And during the church age, he is uh, gathering around himself a people of outcasts. These are the ones that Paul speaks of as those who are fool, foolish in the eyes of the world. They have become fools for Christ's sake. And yet Jesus is training and teaching them to prepare them to be those who will be the cadre and the core of rulers who will come back with him at the second coming and rule and reign in his kingdom once he establishes that kingdom. Several lessons we learn from this. First of all, just because you're anointed the king doesn't mean you are the king. You aren't the king until you take the throne. This destroys amillennialism and postmillennialism. Jesus isn't today the king. He is seated on his father's throne, not on his throne, not on David's throne. And he is anticipating the time, according to Daniel 7, when the Ancient of Days is going to give the Son of Man the kingdom. And that is what I believe is depicted also in Revelation chapter 5, when the Lamb of God comes before the throne of God and is given the title deed to the earth, and it's this big scroll, and he begins to uh, take take each of the seven seals off of it to open it, and that instigates the judgments that come on the earth during the uh, tribulation period. But Jesus doesn't become king until he comes to the earth and removes Satan from the earth and imprisons him in the abyss for a thousand years. David doesn't become king or have any of the privileges of kingship until Saul is dead. And only then can he uh, take, take the kingship. So what we see in David now as we look at what he does in 1 Samuel 21, is that this is a, um, uh, a picture of how a believer applies wisdom in the midst of a difficult situation. It involves ingenuity. It involves creativity of thought, flexibility of thought, and it all flows out of wisdom that is, has been developed because of Bible doctrine in the soul. And so we come to this verse, uh, David comes to Nob. He's been in Nioth with the prophets and with Samuel, and he knows now that Saul is out to kill him, so he leaves and he heads to Nob. And when he gets there, he's met by the high priest who is trembling. He's afraid of what might happen if Saul finds out that David has sought refuge or sanctuary there in Nob. Now here I have a, a map for us. Uh, This is sort of Orientus. Uh, This is the Dead Sea over here. This is the Mediterranean over over here. So we have the Med and the Dead. Okay? And here we have Jerusalem. Okay? And all this, you see all this terrain in the middle. Uh, That's the basic central mountain range that goes from north to south uh, in, in Israel. Here's Jerusalem, and here's Nob. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about the scale. Here's Bethlehem. How far is it from Jerusalem to Bethlehem? If you guess five miles, you're right. Okay, it's not very far. Think about that. That's like from, that's, it's more than five miles from here to the intersection of I-10 and 610. Okay, that's really close. Okay, so that's Jerusalem to Bethlehem. So Nob is even closer. 
not even not even two miles and the temple mount is actually located there's a seven here but that's that's about where the temple mount is located and you can see a little bit if you're uh, 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 that sevens on top of it but there's a valley there that's the kidron valley and Nob is located at least many people think that Nob is located on mount scopus mount scopus is just to the northeast of the temple mount and it's the location of the Hebrew University today. Uh, there's debate over uh, exactly where the location was um, that, at that time. Now, the second part of the geography here is this is Kiriath Jerim. That's where the ark was located. That last time we saw the ark, it was brought there. But all this gets kind of murky in this period. It's exactly where's the tabernacle after the ark left Shiloh, what happened to the tabernacle. Uh, we know that up up here, right, right about here where the arrow is, uh, are just between the yellow line and the red line. That's where Ramah was located. That's where where Samuel is. And Samuel's built a, an altar there, and people are coming there to worship. So things are just a little bit messy uh, here. Uh, over here is Gath. That's Goliath's hometown. And if you can see it, there's a blue line here, and that's the line. Here's Ezekiel. Remember, this is where David fought Goliath right here. And then down south of there, approximately that location, is where the cave of Adullam is located. That's the next chapter when David is hiding in this um, network of caves. Now, I've been down there. Uh, it's an area today that's called Beit Guvrin. And it is a place where they where during the second temple period where they had all these dove coats. It's just amazing how many doves and pigeons that they uh, raised there for temple sacrifice. And it was just just a huge area, but it's a network of caves. And that's where David was for a while, where his mighty men gathered to him. And then down here in the lower right is in Gedi. Uh, that's the second cave that he goes to. That's where he, uh, he runs into Saul inside the cave. Here's another map to orient you. Same thing. Here's Nob just to the northeast of, of, of the temple, what will be the Temple Mount. Uh, here's the cave of Adullam here just below uh, the Valley of Elah. Here's Gath off to the uh, east. That's the city that David's going to head to. And then here's, here's En Gedi. Now, when he comes here in 19.1, or 21.1, rather, he sees Ahimelech. So let's identify Ahimelech. These are Eli's descendants. You remember Eli, he's the high priest in the first four chapters of 1 Samuel. We have Eli, the high priest, and he has two uh, ne'er-do-well sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who are taking advantage of the people in some of the most atrocious ways. Uh, Pinchas, as it's pronounced in the Hebrew, has two sons, Ichabod, who was born there just after the, um, uh, the Battle of Aphek when they lose the Ark. And uh, so his uh, uh, mother says, the name's him Ichabod, for no glory. The glory of the Lord is departed. He's got a brother named Ahitab. And Ahitab is the father of Ahimelech. Uh, this is the line of the priesthood. Remember, there's a curse on, the, uh, on Eli's lineage that they won't have a priest, uh, the priestly line will die out and it will go in another direction. And that's the direction of Zadok, who is going to be, the, it's the Zadokian priesthood in the millennial kingdom. And then Ahimelech is the father of Abiathar and has a brother named Ahijah who basically functions uh, as sort of a chaplain with Saul's, Saul's army. So that's, this is who we're talking about here, Ahimelech the high priest, and then his son is there with the priest in Nob, uh, and he will become a high priest under David. What, what we have here at Nob is a community of priests and their families. This is where they live. They're about four or five miles from Ramah, where uh, the altar is built there by Samuel. There may have put, uh, some people think the tabernacle was reconstructed there, but the ark's over at Kiriath, uh, Kiriath Jerim. Now, Ahimelech is just trembling here uh, when he shows, uh, David shows up, 
and he doesn't uh, know uh, what is going on. He knows this, probably knows that Saul is after David. He was probably aware of what had happened in Nioth when uh, Saul was sending hit teams to capture David, and they would come, and then they would be overpowered by God the Holy Spirit, and they would prophesy with the prophets. He was probably aware of some of this that was going on and of, of Saul's attempt uh, to take David. Uh, so when David shows up, he wants to know where his men are. David is a son-in-law to the king. He's supposed to be leading an army. He's saying, what's, what's going on? Where's your army? What's, what's happening here? And David said to Ahimelech the priest, well, the king has ordered me on some business. And I want you to pay attention to what's going on here. David is very, very careful as to how he answers the question. David is being intentionally ambiguous. He's not coming out and telling a direct lie. He's not making something up. He doesn't identify uh, who the king is here. And many times in the Psalms, David refers to God as the king of Israel. David is about the king's business, not necessarily King Saul's business. And we have passages in the Psalms where David says in Psalm 5-2, Give heed to the voice of my cry, my king and my God. Psalm 20, verse 9, save, Lord, may the king, that's the Lord, answer us when we call. Psalm 24, 7 refers to God as the king of glory. And then 24, 8 defines who the king of glory is as the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. So what we see is David in wisdom is being very careful. He's not giving away too much. He's not answering all the questions. He gives enough of an answer as to be perhaps a little bit misleading, but he's not going to uh, overtly lie. Now, there's a principle in the Torah that it's acceptable to disobey a law, for example, to lie or to deceive, if it is going to save a life. We have examples of that with the midwives in Exodus chapter 1, saving the life of the male children. We have another example of that with Rahab, where she's hiding the two uh, Israelite spies, and the soldiers come and ask her where they are, and she said, oh, they left, they went that, that away. And uh, she's still lying to protect them. And there are examples of that uh, in, in the Torah. Uh, saving a life takes precedence over obedience to lesser laws. It's a matter of grace and mercy and compassion that the spirit of the law at times takes precedent over the uh, letter of the law. But those are extreme situations, for example, if a life is at stake. So this is what David is doing here, is he is uh, acting somewhat, or answering somewhat ambiguously uh, in order to uh, preserve his own life. Uh, so he um, uh, gives this information. He has a great need for food. And uh, because he's shown up with just a, a few attendants, and he says, Now, therefore, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand or whatever can be found. And they've got a little bit of problem because all that Ahimelech has on hand is the sacred bread, the loaves that are part of the table of, of the, the showbread, uh, the loaves of the presence of God. In verse 4 he says, uh, to David, there's no common bread here. Some translations say profane bread. It means common bread, everyday bread that everyday people could eat. They said there's no common bread on hand, but there's holy bread. It's holy not because there's some inherent value in it, but because it's been sanctified and set apart for, the, for God. And under the stipulations, uh, after it has been on display, then it's replaced with fresh bread, and only the priests can eat it because they're the only ones who are ritually cleansed and who can eat the, um, uh, the, the, the holy bread, the sanctified bread. And so, but he recognizes, Ahimelech does, that this is a unique situation. But he says, um, he's thinking that, well, if these guys are soldiers, then they may have been involved with dead bodies. They may have somehow ritually uh, are committed some, something that would render them ritually unclean. And so he says the uh, key thing is that the young men have at least kept themselves from women. That means they haven't had any sexual intimacy for three days. And if you recall in Exodus chapter 
chapter 19, chapter 18, when the Israelites are before God on, the, on, on Mount Sinai, God says they have to cleanse themselves ritually and they have to, uh, for three days. And they cannot have uh, sexual intimacy during that time. Now, it's not because that's immoral or there's something inherently wrong with it. But remember, things are un- declared unclean because they have something to do in one way or another with the curse of sin. And it is through sexual intercourse that the sin nature is passed on from generation to generation. And so that is, God is teaching something in, in what is clean and what is unclean in terms of the, uh, the, the malignancy uh, of sin. So uh, David says, well, these young men are committed to, to a holy war, and therefore they are sanctified. They're ritually cleansed. And so this is fine. The young men, the vessels, that is, the bodies of the young men are are holy or sanctified. The bread is, in effect, common, even though it was consecrated in the vessel this day. In other words, that, that because of their mission, and because that's a sanctified mission, then they can eat of the bread. So the priest gave him holy bread, for there was no bread there but the show bread which had been taken from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place on the day that it was taken. Remember when we were in chapter 20, uh, 20 last time that when David and Jonathan were working out this, this plan to figure out what Saul was up to, it was the time of the new moon. It was the beginning of the month, and there was a big celebration. So at the beginning of the month, they would change out the bread uh, on the table of showbread in the tabernacle and replace it with hot, fresh bread. Now, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go through the next uh, application of this, which takes us into the New Testament, but I'll come back and probably cover that briefly at the beginning next time. I want to go on to what happens in the second part of this, this episode. Uh, while they're there, we're told this. This is just kind of a little little glimpse and a foreshadowing. There's a certain man of the servants of Saul there that day uh, detained before the Lord. We don't know exactly what that means. Maybe he had some service there or or he was uh, maybe he was trying to to uh, repent of something. We have no idea what that means. He's detained before the Lord. His name is Doeg an Edomite. He's not an Israelite. He's an Edomite. And he's the chief of the herdsmen. That means he's over all the flocks of Saul. That's all we hear about Doeg. But Doeg's going to be a bad guy. He'll show up in the next chapter. 1 Samuel 21.8, David needs a weapon. He not only needs food, he needs a weapon. He doesn't have one. So he asks Ahimelech uh, for a weapon. And Ahimelech says uh, in verse 9, I don't have anything other than the sword of Goliath the Philistine. So apparently David had dedicated that to the Lord and put that with the priests, and so he brings it out wrapped in a cloth uh, from behind the ephod, which is a sanctified site, and gives it to David. So now David's got Goliath's sword, and he's the guy who killed Goliath, and he's going to head where? Where's the and, and, and David doesn't just go there surreptitiously. David goes there because he's thinking this out. He says, of all the places around here where Saul would look for me, where's the least likely place he would think that I would go? Goliath's hometown. See, David is using wisdom. That's what we learned from Psalm 34. David is using wisdom, and he's thinking this through, and he's praying about it. And he says, okay, I'm going to go hide out in Goliath's hometown. So he, he takes Goliath's sword, and he goes there. So verse 10 tells us that he goes uh, to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish recognize David, and they say, isn't this David the king of the land? See, they don't understand who he is. There's a misrepresentation of David. He said, didn't they sing of him that Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands? So it's sort of like that scene, if you remember it, in the, in the film uh, Patton where you go into the German high command and they just can't understand why the Allies wouldn't use Patton to lead the invasion onto the continent because they are the, he is the, the warrior general they fear, they fear the most. And Eisenhower is just using him for, for a decoy. That's, that's it. They said, David, this is David. Uh, Saul's got to be up to something. You know, this is extremely dangerous. 
And David realizes that his life is in danger. So what we see here, he's afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. That's what he talks about in Psalm 34, that God delivers him from his fears. He's afraid for his life. So he changed his behavior before them. He pretended madness in their hands. Now, we have to understand something about the ancient world. In the ancient world, among the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, they had a super, superstitious view of insanity and madness and dementia. They thought that somehow you were, this was brought on by the gods, and if anybody messed with anybody who was crazy, then it would anger the gods. So they had all of this superstition about the gods. So, so David is going to use that against them. He understands their religious beliefs and their superstitious beliefs, and he's going to use a, a psyops uh, operation here in order to turn this against him. So he starts acting like he's insane, and he pretends madness. He crawls around on his hands and knees, and he drools, and he scratches on the doors, and uh, pretty much makes a mess out of himself. And Akish looks at him and says, this guy's insane. We can't touch him. If anybody touches him, then the gods will be mad at us. That's what's going on here. Um, so they are going to release David and let him go, and so David is able to escape. So what have we seen here? What we've seen is that, that because of Psalm 34, that David is using wisdom, and he's using wisdom skillfully against his enemies and to protect himself. So even though we're trusting God for the deliverance, that doesn't mean uh, the, the old adage that came out of a Keswick kind of uh, a theology, let go and let God. It's not just fold my hands, God's going to take care of things, and we just don't do anything. We tr pray, we trust, we figure out a strategy, we use the Word of God skillfully, and we put everything in God's hands and then do what we can do. So it's a fascinating combination of human responsibility and divine sovereignty, and we'll see how it comes together uh, next week when we come back and look uh, specifically at the 34th Psalm. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things tonight, to be reminded of the importance of your word, the importance of internalizing doctrine and thinking as you would have us to think, for that bil builds spiritual strength and spiritual courage so that when we face these people tests, when we face opposition, when we face rejection, when we face someone who uh, somehow treats us lightly or hurts our feelings, then we can respond with grace and kindness and uh, treat them uh, not as they deserve, but treat them uh, out of the, the love that we have experienced from you because we don't deserve that either. And Father, we pray that you challenge us with the wisdom principles that we'll discover here and in Psalm 34, that we can face the challenges of life from that wisdom that comes because of the fear of the Lord. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.